Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Catholicism, a podcast about Catholic teaching and why it makes sense. I'm your host, Caitlin West. Welcome to this episode on confession, also known as reconciliation and the sacrament of penance. I am so excited to talk about this topic because I love confession. I love it. I love confession. It's the best. I mean, do I enjoy it? No. (laughs) Like, I don't actively enjoy saying my sins out loud to a priest. But at the same time, I love confession. And I think those two things are compatible. We can love confession because it makes us better people and it makes us happier people. And it's where we go to experience God's mercy and forgiveness. So for that reason, we can love it, even though it's not like actively fun. It makes me think of, you know, when little kids have to take a bath. Like I remember I used to babysit this girl and she was about like three years old at the time. And I kid you not, every evening we would go through the same routine. It would get to like 7 p.m. and I'd be like, okay, time for a bath now. And every night she'd be like, no way, Jose, absolutely not. I do not want to take a bath. I am midway through reenacting the entire Avatar The Last Airbender series in the back room with my brother. The last thing I want to do is stop what I'm doing, take off my warm clothes and get into a bath. So then I'd have to like beg and plead and then eventually she would begrudgingly get into the bath. And then the most incredible thing would happen. She would get in and within about 30 seconds, she was having the time of her life. And then the problem would become that I couldn't get her out of the bath. I'd have to stand there being like, come on, it's time for bed. And she'd be like, I'm a waterbender, get out. And then eventually, you know, when she was out of the bath and she was warm and dry and all snuggly and clean and ready for bed, I'd be like, see, aren't you glad that you had a bath? And she'd be like, yeah, (laughs) baths are the best. And then the next night, of course, she would forget and we would go through the whole thing again. And I think we can be kind of like that with confession, right? Like the idea of actually going into the confessional and saying all of our sins out loud to the priest can feel so unappealing in the moment that we forget how good it is for us and how awesome we feel afterwards knowing that our sins are completely forgiven. I mean, we don't always feel awesome when we come out of confession and that's totally fine, but we know intellectually that confession is making us a better person. And I think that's one thing that people often misunderstand about confession. They think that it's all about guilt or blame or making you feel bad for being such a big sinner. And that is, I mean, some people have had that experience in confession. They've had a negative experience and that sucks. (laughs) It's such a huge shame because that is not at all what confession is supposed to be about. Confession is not about guilt and sin. That's like saying that baths are all about dirt, right? Like baths aren't about dirt. Dirt is what happens before the bath. And whether or not we take a bath, the dirt is going to be there. The bath is where we wash it away. And sure, like, you know, if you've been out in the garden or you've gone for a bushwalk and you're particularly grimy and then you come home and you have a shower, you might actually see all of the dirt falling off you and you have that moment of like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how grimy I was. And in the same way, when we go to confession and we're listing off all of our sins, we might have that moment where we're like, oh my gosh, I am such a numpty. (laughs) But that's not the point of confession. Like the only reason that the sort of dirt is being called attention to is because it's being washed away. Now, Okay, at this point, there are probably some of you, especially if you're not Catholic, who are hearing this and thinking, okay, sure, so we need to be washed clean of our sins. But isn't that what baptism is for? Like, surely that's where our sins are forgiven. Are you saying that baptism isn't enough? And secondly, even if we do need to confess our sins and be forgiven, why do we have to go and confess them to a priest? Like, why can't we just go straight to God and confess our sins to him? Okay. Those are two great points. First of all, you'd be absolutely right to say that we are washed clean of sin in baptism. The catechism in point 1427 refers to baptism as the first and fundamental conversion, right? So baptism is what puts us into that initial state of grace. In baptism, we're freed from original sin. However, We know from our own personal experience that just because we've been baptized, that doesn't mean that we're never going to sin again. It's like, you know, if a baby was born and you gave it that kind of first wash to get all of the gunk off it. And then you sort of, you know, wiped your hands clean and were like, well, guess that kid's never going to need a bath again. (laughs) Like, no, of course not. We need continual cleaning throughout our lives. 
And the same is true for our souls. And this is something the Catechism points out in point 1426. Even if sin is washed away in baptism, our inclination towards sin remains. I mean, this is why we say, forgive us our sins every time we say the Our Father. Jesus taught us to ask God for his forgiveness continually, regularly, because we consistently need God's forgiveness. And of course, the first thing that we do when we've sinned is we say sorry to God directly. And this is where we come to that second objection. Of course, when we sin, we should always go straight to God and say sorry. And in fact, the church teaches us that when it comes to venial sin, so those smaller sins that we commit, it can be enough for us to just go to God and say sorry. Like we don't technically need to go to confession to be forgiven of those smaller sins. I mean, the church encourages us to say venial sins in confession because it's good for us, and we'll talk more about that later, but we don't technically have to. In fact, the catechism in points 1434 to 39 lists a whole bunch of other things that we can do and that we should do. We should do all of these things to show God that we're sorry and to obtain his forgiveness. So it talks about things like prayer, fasting, giving to the poor, acts of charity, receiving the Eucharist, reading the Bible, praying the Our Father. Like these are all ways that we can, you know, say sorry to God and receive his mercy. However, there are instances where we do need to say our sins in confession. When it comes to mortal sins, so these are grave, serious sins against God's law. So things like, you know, adultery and murder. It's not enough when we've committed a big sin to just say sorry to God in our hearts. Although, of course, we should do that as well. The church teaches us that if we have deliberately committed a mortal sin, we have to go to confession. And this is something that I think we can understand even just on like a human level, that when we hurt someone in a more serious way, something actually gets broken that needs to be repaired. And that's why there are often more kind of formal processes around forgiveness and restitution for serious things. Like when we commit a big crime, we can't just go to that person and say, sorry, we actually have to go through the justice system. So there's this bit in Shakespeare's play Hamlet where, spoiler, (laughs) Hamlet accidentally kills the dad of this guy Laertes. And then Laertes, in response, challenges Hamlet to a duel. And before the duel starts, Hamlet says sorry to Laertes. He's like, look, I'm really sorry. I haven't been well. I didn't mean to kill your dad (laughs) or to hurt you. And Laertes' response is really interesting. He basically says, you know, in my heart, I forgive you. Like, I don't actually feel angry anymore. But for the sake of justice, we still need to go through this kind of formal process of restoring the balance. And it's the same with confession. When we commit a mortal sin, we actually cut ourselves off from the church and we kill the life of grace in our souls. And that's a big deal, right? So it makes sense that Christ instituted this more kind of formal way of being sort of brought back into communion with the church. But the other reason why we need to go to confession, particularly after committing a serious sin, is for our own sakes, right? So that we can actually have a tangible sign of God's mercy and forgiveness. I remember speaking to this Protestant woman who was telling me, you know, that she'd done something bad that she felt really bad about because it was kind of a big thing. And she was saying like, you know, I I know that God loves me and I know that he forgives me. But also, I kind of don't know that. (laughs) Like, I just, there's no tangible sign. I have to just trust that God forgives me. And that's really, really hard to do. And of course, we can trust that God loves and forgives us. Like, that's not unreasonable. But, and we've talked about this in previous episodes, this is one of the reasons why Christ instituted the sacraments, because he knows that we need tangible signs of his grace working in our lives. So there's this book that I love called The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. And in it, there's this bit where the main character, Maggie, has really hurt her cousin, Lucy. And it's interesting because she talks about how she knows that Lucy loves her and that Lucy will forgive her. But at the same time, she's still yearning for that kind of face-to-face conversation with her. So it says, 
Maggie hungered for an interview with Lucy, if it were only for five minutes, to utter a word of penitence, to be assured by Lucy's own eyes and lips. And I think this is sometimes how we feel when we've committed a sin. We're like, I just wish I could you know, sit across from our Lord and say, I'm sorry to him and hear his voice saying, that's okay, I forgive you. And that's what's beautiful about confession. That's what we get when we go to confession. Now, of course, when we go to confession, we don't literally hear Christ's voice telling us, I forgive you. What we hear is the voice of the priest. So that might lead us to kind of think, well, why is the priest offering me forgiveness? Like, why do I have to go and confess my sins to this man who is a sinner just like me? I want Christ's forgiveness, not the priest's forgiveness. Bishop Barron often quotes the author Flannery O'Connor talking about the Eucharist. And she says, If the Eucharist is just a symbol, then I say to hell with it. I love that sentiment. And it's kind of the same with confession, right? Like if this is just Father Ted or Father Bob forgiving me, then to hell with it. Why do I need the forgiveness of this priest who's a sinner just like me? But here we return to an idea that we brought up in the last episode of the priest acting in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. So when I go to confession... I'm not confessing my sins to the priest. I'm confessing my sins to Christ. And when I receive absolution and forgiveness, I'm not receiving it from the priest. I'm receiving it from Christ through the priest. So we can see how this works if we turn to the Gospels. John chapter 20. Christ appears to his disciples after the resurrection. And it says, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So what's really important here is that Christ doesn't just like straight up give the apostles power to forgive sins. He doesn't like look at Peter and say like, well, Peter, you're a really great judge of character. I reckon you can have the power to forgive sins. No, it's got nothing to do with the apostles and their personal capacity. The first thing he does is he breathes on them and gives them the Holy Spirit, and then he gives them power to forgive sins. In other words, the power isn't theirs, the power is God's, and God allows his apostles to act as channels of his forgiveness. So that is what we experience when we go to confession, and that's why we don't have to worry about whether we you know, particularly like the priest that we're confessing to, or whether he really gets us, or even if we think he's a particular particularly good person. And this is something that Scott Hahn talks about. He talks about how, you know, even if your doctor has a terrible diet and he never exercises, he can still prescribe medicine for you, right? Because his ability to heal doesn't depend on how healthy he personally is. And it's the same with the priest. Now, because confession is an encounter with God and it's not about the priest, what that means is that the sins you confess in the confessional are not the priests to share. They are between you and God. So the priest doesn't have the right to discuss or share or act on anything that you say in the confessional under any circumstances ever on pain of excommunication. Like it's really serious. So the Code of Canon Law, point 983, says... It is absolutely forbidden for a confessor to betray in any way a penitent, in words or in any manner, and for any reason. So literally, even if the priest's life is in danger, if someone's like, I will kill you unless you tell me what that person said in confession, they are not permitted to say what was said in confession. And partly, again, this is because the sins that are confessed aren't the priest's sins to share. But it's also because the church doesn't want anything ever to stand in the way of people accessing God's mercy, including the fear that other people are going to find out about the sins that you confessed. So in some parts of the world, including in Australia, the government has passed laws that make it mandatory for priests to report certain offenses that come up in the confessional. So things like sexual abuse. And there was this like journalist commentator guy who spoke up about this when these laws were first being passed. And he wasn't Catholic, right? He's a Muslim. But he pointed this out. He was like, this is the dumbest law ever. Because think about it. 
If someone knows that the sins they are going to confess will be reported to the police immediately, then they're just not going to confess those sins, right? They're not going to go to confession. And in a situation like that, not only is justice not served, but also that person has then missed out on receiving God's mercy and forgiveness as well. It's like a lose-lose situation. And of course, it's important. It's so important that if a serious crime has occurred, that there is justice. But the way to achieve that justice isn't to force priests to break the seal of confession. In fact, if someone has committed a crime, it's actually better if they can come to the priest and talk to the priest, and then the priest can urge them to do something about it, right? To turn themselves in or to confess to their crimes. Especially, you know, if that person is truly sorry for their sins, which we presume they would be if they have come to confession, then they'll hopefully be in a state where they're more ready to make restitution. And actually, this is something that the Catechism talks about in point 1451, that a prerequisite for going to confession is that we have to be sorry for our sins, what we call contrition. So the Catechism defines contrition as sorrow of the soul, detestation for the sin committed together with the resolution not to sin again. So three things there. First of all, we've got to be sorry. Second of all, we have to hate the sin, hate the sin itself, right? Not the sinner. We don't have to hate ourselves. We have to hate the thing that's bad. And then thirdly, we have to have a genuine desire not to sin again. This requirement can freak people out a little bit when they hear it, because you might think, well, like sometimes I go to confession and I am sorry for my sins, but there is a part of me that's kind of like, well, it was kind of fun (laughs) or like it did feel kind of good. Or maybe, you know, I'm sorry, but only because I'm scared that I'll go to hell and not because I love God. So in those circumstances, is my confession not valid? Like have I not met those requirements? Well, the catechism goes on to distinguish between perfect and imperfect contrition. So ideally, we want to be perfectly contrite. So that means that our sorrow is complete and it arises out of love of God rather than fear of punishment. So that's the ideal situation, perfect contrition. And that's what we should always be aiming for. However, if there's one thing we know about God, we know that it's he accepts us even when we're not perfect. So even if we're not perfectly contrite, God's mercy is infinite and so is his grace, provided that we're not like, you know, totally not sorry at all. If we're walking in being like, I don't care. I'm glad I did it. I totally do it again. Okay. Well, in that situation, you've kind of closed the door to God's mercy. There's nothing he can really do about that. But provided that the door is open, even just a crack, God will pour his mercy through it and he will shower his graces on us. And in fact, the catechism talks about how, you know, the grace of the sacrament of confession can also help us to be more contrite. So we should never hold off from going to confession because we're worried that we're not sorry enough. We should always go. I mean, if you're going to confession, then that's a good sign that you're at least a little bit sorry for what you've done. And then when we think about that third requirement, which is that we have to be resolved not to sin again, it's important to point out that this doesn't mean that we have to guarantee for sure that I will never commit that sin again. Okay, we're human beings. We know that we can't make those kind of guarantees, but we have to sincerely resolve to do our best. So when my little sister was about two years old, she absolutely hated going to bed because she wanted to stay up and hang out with the rest of us. So every night the whole thing would be drawn out for ages and she'd have a cry. She didn't want to go to bed. So one night it was getting close to bedtime and my dad looked at her across the room and was like, now Ella, you won't make a big fuss tonight when it's time for bed, will you? And Ella looked at him and sighed very sincerely and said, well, I hope not, but I probably will. (laughs) I love that. It's so honest. (laughs) And sometimes I think our contrition can be like that. It's like, I sincerely hope that I won't do this again. And more than just hope, with the grace of God, I am going to try. I'm going to do my best to not commit this sin again. But I also need to balance that with an awareness of my own human frailty. Okay, so contrition. We have to be sorry for our sins. So that's the first step. And then the second step, of course, is that we have to confess our sins. 
So for anyone who hasn't actually been to confession before, or if you haven't been for a while, I'm actually going to include a link to a kind of guide to confession in the show notes for you to look at. I'm also going to include an examination of conscience, which can help us to prepare for confession. But we won't go into all of that now. For now, all we need to say is that when we go to confession, we need to confess any and all mortal sins that our conscience accuses us of. And of course, the church also strongly encourages us to confess our venial sins as well. But if we do have any mortal sins on our conscience, we have to confess all of them, not just some of them. We don't get to pick and choose. We have to confess all of them. And that makes sense when we think about it, because like, imagine if you had been mortally wounded in two different places and then you went to the doctor and you only showed the doctor one of those wounds. Like the doctor can heal that wound, but that kind of doesn't matter because the other one is going to kill you anyway. So it's the same with confession. We need to reveal all of our wounds to our Lord in the confessional. Fulton Sheen talks about confession as being like a kind of spiritual nakedness where we reveal the true state of our souls to God. And that is really hard to do. <laughs> that is difficult. Like confession, it's not like mass where you can kind of go and stand up the back and zone out and be a little bit passive and feel like you're going unnoticed. Confession's not like that. When we go to confession, we have to like actively bear our souls in front of God and be like, okay, this is who I am. And one of the things that often stops people from doing that is that they're scared. Like scared, first of all, of what God will think. And secondly, scared of what the priest will think, because, you know, we can say all we like that the priest is in persona Christi, but at the same time, we have that very human awareness that we're speaking to another human being. And we're like, oh, what's the priest going to think? Like, is he going to judge me? Is he going to be angry? Like, I feel really embarrassed that I have this sin to confess. And I actually was talking about this with a priest in the confessional the other day. I was asking him how he would respond to that fear, because it's such a common fear. What will the priest think? And he said a couple of things, both of which I've I've actually heard many other priests say before, the first being that the priest usually doesn't even remember what the penitent has said. I know Father Mike Schmitz talks about it as a kind of like amnesia. It's like a special grace from God that the priest forgets what the penitent has said. So it's not like the priest is walking around thinking about the sins that you've committed or next time they see you, they're going to think, oh, that's that person who did that thing. No. Secondly, we might go into confession thinking that we are the only person who has ever committed this sin or that we're going to shock or scandalize the priest. And this is something that this priest said and that I've heard many other priests say as well, that there's pretty much nothing you can say to a priest in the confessional that would shock them. <laughs> like, they've pretty much heard everything. <laughs> and secondly, far from being shocked or scandalized when someone says something, you know, really big in confession, it's more likely that the priest will be moved by your honesty and your courage, just like a mother would be when their child confesses something to her that, you know, that was really difficult. And this is something that's reinforced by the catechism when it talks about the role of the priest in confession. In point number 1465, the catechism says that in confession, the priest is fulfilling the ministry of the good shepherd who seeks the lost sheep, the good Samaritan who binds up wounds, the father who awaits the prodigal son and welcomes him on his return. So we can take consolation from that, especially if we're nervous about going to confession. Now, does that mean that when we go to confession, all that will happen is that we'll get like a nice little pat on the head and the priest will be like, well done you, good on you for coming to confession and then send you on your way. No, the priest will encourage us, offer us some advice and some guidance. He might help you to see how you could improve in a certain area. And then he'll give you what we call penance. So penance is something that you do to show our Lord that you're sorry and to kind of make amends for your sins. And we've talked about this before, right? That it's one thing to be forgiven, but you still need to make amends. So the catechism in point 1460 talks about the different forms that penance can take. It says it can consist of prayer and offering, works of mercy, service of neighbor, voluntary self-denial, sacrifices, and above all, the patient acceptance of the cross. And again, this is such a reminder of God's mercy. Like, think about it. We have sinned against God himself. He could impose 
any penalty he likes on us for that. He would be well within his rights to give us a really harsh penance, but he doesn't. It makes me think of like when a kid does something really naughty and the kid feels really bad and they say sorry to their mum, and then the mum is like, you know what, that's okay, just give me a hug and we'll call it even. <laughs> and you look at that and you're like, that is so not proportionate. <laughs> but that's the love of a parent, right? And it's exactly the same with God. So the precise form that confession has taken over the last 2,000 years, like exactly how it's been carried out, hasn't always been exactly the same. So the Catechism talks in point 1447 about how in the early church, confession and penance occurred in much more public settings. And kind of like communion, at times it didn't occur as regularly. But the Catechism goes on to say that despite those kind of external changes in the way that the sacrament has been celebrated, the same fundamental structure has always been there. And this structure contains two essential elements. First of all, the penitent, so the person who confesses. And that person goes through the process of contrition, confession, and satisfaction or penance. And then the second element, so kind of like the flip side of the coin, is the forgiveness of sins by God through the bishop and the priests in the name of Jesus. And it's actually amazing when we look at the writings of the early church fathers, we can see that fundamental structure present. So, for instance, we have someone like Origen writing around the year 248 AD, talking about penance, when the sinner does not shrink from declaring his sin to a priest of the Lord and from seeking medicine after the manner of him who says, to the Lord, I will accuse myself of my iniquity. So one other thing before we wrap up, the catechism tells us in point 1457 that all Catholics who have reached the age of reason are obliged to confess any serious sins that they've committed at least once a year. And this is basically just the church looking after her own, right? Like she doesn't want any Catholics to die in the state of mortal sin. So as a bare minimum, she says, okay, at least once a year, if you've committed any serious sins, you have to go to confession and confess them. As well as that, obviously, if we've committed a mortal sin, we shouldn't go to communion until we've been to confession. We also need to go to confession before we receive our first communion. So this applies to kids who are going through their first Holy Communion. And it also applies to people who are going through the RCIA. So this is an exception that the church makes. Normally, non-Catholics wouldn't receive confession. But if you are in the process of becoming Catholic, then you can go to confession before you're fully incorporated into the Catholic Church. Now, all of that is the absolute bare minimum, right? That's what you need to do to just keep your head above water. But when it comes to serious sins, it makes sense that we would want to go to confession, not just once a year, but as soon as possible. I remember my mum used to say when I was a little kid, she'd be like, look, if someone ripped your arm off and you were bleeding out, you would rush to the hospital, right? You wouldn't just hang around home and put it off. It's exactly the same as our soul. If we're mortally wounded, then we should run to confession as soon as possible. And think about it. Like when you go to confession, all of your sins are wiped away and you get to start totally fresh. You don't have to carry them around with you. So why wouldn't you kind of drop that burden? It's literally the best feeling, especially if you haven't been in a while. And one thing to remember as well, like, you know, when you need to apologize to a friend for something that you've done wrong and you really dread the conversation because you don't know how they're going to react. You don't know what they're going to say or if they're going to get angry with you or maybe they're going to reject you. Well, we don't have to feel like that about God. Like we know exactly what will happen if we go to confession. If we go to confession and we're sorry for our sins, we are going to receive forgiveness. We're going to hear those words of absolution. I absolve you from your sins. We know for a fact that God is not just going to forgive us. He's going to rejoice that we've gone to confession. I mean, you could practically open the Gospels at any random point and find Jesus being like, I am so happy every time someone repents. <laughs> He's like given us that guarantee so many times in the Gospels. And all of this applies not just to mortal sins, but also to venial sins. Like, as we've already said, technically we don't have to confess venial sins, but oh my gosh, why wouldn't you? <laughs> because confession, okay, yes, it wipes away our sins, but it also gives us so many graces that help us to do better and to avoid sin in the future. And in our spiritual life, we don't want to just survive, right? We want to thrive. We want to be saints. So point 1458 of the Catechism says, regular confession of our venial sins 
helps us to form our conscience, fight against evil tendencies, let ourselves be healed by Christ, and progress in the life of the Spirit. So in other words, regular confession helps to sanctify us. That regular washing of our soul helps to purify it. I mean, even just from a human perspective, getting into the habit of regularly acknowledging the ways in which we have failed and saying sorry and trying again, that's the kind of thing that people pay hundreds of dollars, you know, for a professional to help them do. And we get to do it, you know, if we want to, we can go every month or every fortnight or even every week, not because we're weird and we have guilt complexes, but because we love our Lord and we want to sprint towards heaven as quickly as we can. So... Here's my challenge to you. Sometime in the next fortnight, if you are able to go to confession, go to confession, get yourself there. Confession is the best. You will feel so much better after you've gone. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Go to confession. Okay, I'm going to post in the show notes a link to a song that basically sums up how I feel every time I go to confession. It's the best feeling, just in case anyone needs any more motivation. Okay, so that is all we've got time for today. Thank you for sticking with me. Next time, we're going to be talking about the anointing of the sick. Have a great fortnight. I will talk to you soon. Bye.